Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this event. Uh, we're, um, I am Sue Ann Caulfield. I'm a professor in the history department as well as in the residential college. Um, and I would like to begin first by acknowledging that the University of Michigan resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishwabeg, the Three Fire Confederacy of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations, as well as the Wyandotte Nation. Um, and before I begin by introducing our uh, very special guest, um, uh, Professor Steve Bratner, who is the director of the Donia Center, would like to uh, make a comment of welcome on behalf of Donia. Thank you, uh, Sue Hello, I'm Steve Ratner. I'm a professor over at the law school, and I am the director of the Donia Human Rights Center, which is the university's focal point for the study of human rights. We sponsor um, monthly uh, speakers events, including uh, with great pleasure, um, Elisa Onkon uh, today. Um, I just want to express our excitement to see so many of you today. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Suzanne has really done all the hard work on making this event such a success, and we're grateful to her, and we look forward to a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. And in addition to the Donia Center, our co-sponsors include the History Department, the Law School, um, and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Please. Studies. So. I don't Oh, I'm sorry. And the department, of course, the Department of Romance Languages. Thank you. Okay, so now it is my immense pleasure to introduce to you Professor Elisa Loncon Antileo. Professor Loncon is currently professor of education and uh, at and founder of the Mapuche Language and Cultures Program at the University of Santiago in Chile. And in 2021, she was elected as a representative of the Mapuche people to the Chilean Constitutional Convention and she was then elected president of the convention uh, as its first president. And when she gave her inaugural address for the convention, uh, Professor Loncon announced that on that day, a new Chile has been created. One that's pluralistic, multilingual, inclusive of all of its cultures, all of its peoples, its women, and all of its territories. This is our dream for writing the new constitution. So that dream has yet to be realized because the proposal for the con Constitution didn't pass a national plebiscite that was required for its passage and, and adoption by Chile. And so the work has now begun anew. However, the convention in itself nonetheless represents an a important step forward. Um, and among the, among the unprecedented achievements of the convention was the participation of indigenous Chileans such as uh, Professor Moncon, uh, as representatives of their original nations. And this achievement represents the culmination of not only a uh, national social uprising that had been going on since 2019, but also of many decades or even really many centuries of struggle um, for the survival of indigenous communities, cultures, and languages in Chile, as well as around the world. And in her pathbreaking and prolific scholarly work on indigenous cultures and languages, both in Chile as well as in other regions of the world, as well as in her lifelong work as a public intellectual and artist and an activist, Professor Loncon has played a significant role in this historical struggle. And she was born in Mapuche, uh, in the Mapuche community of Lefueluan on her ancestral lands. And she studied languages in college and then she got her PhD first um, in the Netherlands at the University of Leiden in humanities, and then another PhD in literature from the Catholic University of Chile. And she specializes in linguistics and has successfully crusaded throughout her career for the serious study and teaching of indigenous language, and in particular, the Mapuche language, Mapuche Nong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was practicing before the talk. Um, so her numerous academic articles illuminate not only uh, linguistic theory and methods as applied to indigenous languages, but her work also establishes why it matters to teach indigenous language in a culturally appropriate way. And maybe more importantly, how to teach those languages in a pro uh, 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 culturally appropriate way. And so, um, for example, among the many books that she's written, is a series on teaching Mapuche uh, in culturally uh, uh, appropriate ways. 
Um, other books that she's authored focus on public policies for indigenous education, um, bilingual and intercultural pedagogy in Chile, as well as in the South of Mexico, where she's done work throughout Latin America, and also how to apply the pedagogical innovations that have been developed in these places to other regions of the world. So how do you use these methods in ways that are culturally appropriate for teaching indigenous languages elsewhere? So for her substantial contributions to the defense of human rights throughout her career, uh, Professor London um, Professor London was awarded the Renee Casson Human Rights Award from the Basque government. And she was named one of the 100 most influential people of 2021 by Time Magazine, as well as one of the 25 most influential women in the same year by the Financial Times. And we are so honored to welcome Professor London to the University of Michigan. And please join us in, in welcoming her. May I interrupt just for a moment? Because we had scheduled an event, I mean, a, a presentation to heaven right now, and the document shall be just. Oh, trash talk. It just arrived from, from, from the Lansing Mission. Yes. Okay, so we, exciting. Okay, so, so we are very honored to welcome among the many international um, awards for human rights that Professor Long Kong has received is our Michigan. King Parks Chavez Award that has just been delivered um, express <laughs> in her office in Lansing. So please join me in congratulating her for it. recognition. I'll just read it very quickly. and so there are several signatures from the governor and other um, Thank you so much to have the honor of receive that recognition from the University of Michigan. I want to say my mother tongue, Mari Mari Pudamien, Mari Mari Pukimelfe, Mari Mari Puchelon Kolelut Fachi, Weyil Wemeu, Mari Mari Lamien, Mayat Kazib, we say. Um, uh, for me, it's very important to stay here, to receive the recognition of myself, but I think that it is uh, the recognition of my people and the recognition of my communities and also my elders, because I am not isolated in the world. I belong to my people. I belong to the mother heart. So all of them, I, they are proud uh, for this recognition. Thank you so much. Um, I want to say thank you uh, to Donia Human Rights Center, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Study and the uh, Department of uh, uh, the Roman languages. Thank you to the authorities of these uh, programs. Thank you to, for the teacher and all of you, the students, and also the Chilean community that has also is here, indigenous community that are participating in that meeting. I want to talk about the Chilean process of uh, the political process that we, we were part of uh, last a few years and 
to talk about an inclusive democratic constituents process from Chile that uh, wrote a constitutional proposal that defines Chile uh, as Chile is a social and democratic state of law. It is plurinational, intercultural, regional, and also ecological. Um, despite it, it was rejected in the referendum in September 2022. Uh, but it was important. It is an important contribution to understand an inclusive democracy that responds to the need of the society of the 21st century. This is an indelible experience of the Chilean history. The rejection uh, was a multifactorial reason and in which um, hate speech and the uh, lies against indigenous, against feminist movement, and against uh, social demands played an important role. Um, first, I, I will focus in three points uh, uh, to express the context of this process, then to talk about the what's the plurinationality mean, and then the lesson that we, uh, for us, uh, it is important. Um, in the context, um, you have to know that uh, in Chile, we have a very so a big social movement against the dictatorship uh, regime and also against the constitution that was written during that period um, because in that constitution uh, there was not a democratic constitution and installed the neoliberal model with a subsidiary state where the power of the state um, is attained uh, is against the social rights and the power of state is weak, and also uh, the state uh, give the power to the economical uh, area and system in order to for the privatization of the social right, education, health, pension, and also favoring the an elite and displacing majority of the Chilean to the social marginalization and also economic uh, ec uh, marginalization. In during our history, there is no constitution rating but women, not by indigenous people, just for the elite, elite from the power. And what happened after the dictatorship regime in Chile? The political parties uh, came and negotiated with the model, with the neoliberal model, and they governed just for their interests, not for the people's rights. So um, uh, the parties, political parties, they lost the legitimacy inside the citizenship, and the political situation became so difficult. In 2006, high school students started the Penguin Revolution. We call them Penguin because they use a very special uh, dress, uh, white, uh, white blouse and blue pants or dress. So uh, they uh, initiated a revolution demanding the public education. After that, in 2011, uh, the st student from the university uh, mobilized for the free education. Then a social movement and women uh, connected them and 
the movement, social movement become bigger and bigger along the years. In October 2019, millions of people took the street to demand political and social change. And the government had to find institutional, institutional solution. In November 2019, the parliament agreed to call for a referendum in order to consult uh, to the people the change of the constitution. We the people win because 80% accepted that we need to change the constitution and also to elected people um, to write that constitution. Um, so the, uh, in the history, in the Chilean history, the constitution used to define uh, Chile as a unique and indivisible uh, nation. But that's indivisible nation, not divisible nation, go against, against the plurality of the nation because the Chilean is one nation, but there are 10 indigenous nations more that are not included inside that historical definition. So uh, indigenous, we were excluded along the history in our country. In, uh, we, we are outside the constitution. So um, in 2020, the parliament uh, accepted that a uh, special uh, seat for indigenous people, Escaño Reservado for indigenous. So they accepted 17 uh, Escaño Reservado, special seat for us. And also the uh, a year uh, before they accepted the parity, the, the participation of women uh, inside the, the process. So um, there is other antecedent that is good to consider here uh, is the solidarity of the Chilean people with the indigenous mm -hmm. movement. We, we, we have been object of uh, militarization and very uh, a, 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 a very hard process of discrimination by the Chilean state and Chilean law and Chilean policy. And they, the Chilean policy used to say that the indigenous people are, we are violent and persecuted us as violence. In 2018, uh, they killed um, a young man, uh, Camilo Cachillanca, uh, but there was no reason to kill him. And that uh, started uh, to mobilize the Chilean non-indigenous people in order to uh, look for more information what it was going on inside of indigenous movement to know the culture to know our struggle and the solidarity become bigger and bigger so uh, when the the when the constitutional process started indigenous people we were very popular uh, because they believe in our struggle for justice, mm -hmm. it is the same of the Chilean society because all of us, we were excluded uh, by the law and by the politician that negotiate with the neoliberal uh, uh, movement and representative. So, uh, we initiate the, the constitutional process. And what's the plurinationality mean for us? I want to say that plurinationality implies the recognition of pre-existing nation to the state. 
that is recognizing the indigenous people who inhabit in uh, and inhabited before the nation state was formed. The recognition imply respecting their fundamental rights, autonomy, self-determination, territorial rights, language rights, cultural rights, uh, as was established by ILO Convention uh, 169, and the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Human Rights. Uh, in the constitutional proposal, the implementation of the plurinationality was something possible. It was an alternative, a, a possible alternative, because it was accompanied by the interculturality, uh, multilingualism, priority, and social rights. Uh, no one was deprived of any rights. Uh, so this is was very important. So we recognize inside that proposal the coexistence of diversity of people and nation uh, inside one state, different nation inside one state, the Chilean state. So we recognize Aymara, people, Orapanui, Likanantai, Quechua, Poya, Diaguita, Shango, Cahuesca, Yagan, Zeltman, and also Chilean nation. And we recognize also that the, the intercultural dialogue is incorporated as a principle for the exercise of public function. All of the public, public function must be intercultural to respect the difference, respect the different culture and different people. We also recognize the language, uh, indigenous language, uh, including also sign language and Spanish. Uh, Self-determination and the autonomy of the indigenous people. The, the right to be consulted because of the ILO Convention, recognize the right of indigenous people to be consulted uh, by the state uh, when we when they prepare something for the people uh, connected with the need of the people. Also, uh, we uh, um, <coughs> recognize the demand for the territorial indigenous territorial autonomy and respecting the right to the property uh, of all of the people, because uh, uh, individual property uh, belong to the people and we respect it. But we need the state that recognize our uh, territorial property, individual property, and also collective property inside. So, uh, the other point that we recognize uh, according with the plurinationality is the, the legal system of indigenous people. Because indigenous people, we have our own meaning of the justice and rules inside of our communities. And include uh, all the social rights, right for the education, right for the for the health, uh, pensions, housing, and we included also the the state must promote a society where women, men, diversity, and sexual and their dissident participate in condition of substantive equity, equality recognizing that their effective representation is a principle and minimum condition for the full and substantive exercise of democracy, democracy and the citizenship. All of us need to be respected in our identity. And so also, uh, we include the recognition and the protection of human rights 
inclusion, gender equality, social justice, respect for nature, peace, coexistence, and the peaceful resolution of conflict, and with the recognition, respect, and promotion of the right of indigenous and tribal people and nation, uh, according with the international uh, human rights law. So uh, the, 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 the parity, the, the paridad in, in Spanish uh, include the recognition of all of diversity, uh, but including the right of women, the representation of women uh, in equal relationship with men. We recognize also the, the right of nations. We say that nature have the right to respect and protect uh, its existence, to re regenerate, maintain, and restore its function and dynam dynamic balance, uh, which include natural cycle ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, the right of the of animal as sentient sentient subject. Uh, that is was very important. Also include the every person has the right of uh, of responsible responsible and universal access to the mountain, river, banks, sea, beach, lakes, uh, a wetland. Uh, because in the uh, the state the private uh, the privatization of those space it doesn't permit the people to use it that that place so uh, we recognize also uh, the territorial sea and its seabed as natural common goods. Uh, beaches, uh, the waters, glaciers, uh, wetland, geothermal field, air, and atmosphere, the high mountain, protected area, and native forest. Um, uh, that the constitution must be uh, protected by law. So um, the I want to say that the also the we recognize the right for water water as human rights as human right because the we have private water in, in my country. There is no right for water today. Recognize also the the region, the autonomy of region, because today we have a very centralized uh, poly uh, order inside uh, all the power is concentrated in the capital in Santiago. And region are dying because they don't have the power of decision. So we recognize the decentralized the policy of decentralization of the Xinjiang territory. Um, so uh, I want to say that the plurinationality that we talk about in that uh, proposal is connected with uh, human rights is connected with uh, women's rights. It's connected with uh, nature rights, diversity of rights, and it's a common project to have a um, powerful nation where, where all the people must be participated um, for a common future. This is the, the it, for us, it was a very powerful proposal. Uh, the plurinationality is a proposal for coexistence among all Chilean, which is implemented through the recognition of diversity and human rights with an expanded conception of democracy and a vision of human rights that incorporate the social rights, right of the people and diversity and the right of the nation. Plurinationality is based on substantive equality between subject and their indissoluble relationship with nature. 
uh, human right cannot be exercised if there is no uh, dry for water, dry for water, for instance, if there are not right to, to access the, to the beaches or to the mountain, if people, uh, if people continue to kill in the diversity uh, due, to, due to the extractive ex exploitation of the motherhood. Um, so for us, the contribution of this proposal um, uh, allow us to turn to a new society that respects the right of the people and that is decolonized uh, to the extent that uh, it assumes new form of government. Because not only white people must be the government, all the people need to be need to participate inside the, the decision of the country. Um, it's very important the substantive uh, relationship of the people with the nature. Uh, because nature is not uh, far from us, nature is inside of us. Um, we need it to recognize it because mineral is inside of our body, what it is inside of our body. So there is a different conception of what is nation. So uh, that is why we need to protect the nation. Um, in that uh, proposal, the, we, we make a um, dialogue with, with social movement, with uh, also political parties, and we were a majority. I told you that the uh, indigenous people uh, uh, reserve seat, we were just 17 persons, but we uh, uh, create consensus with the Chilean people. So uh, we were able to support the Chilean demands and also the Chilean people support our demands. Um, we think that the plurinationality is the political way to resolve the conflict of the state with the people, overcome genocide, racism, that uh, also demands a, a coexistence, the relationship uh, uh, between us. And, and today it is possible to get it, that plurinationality. 30 years ago, it was more difficult mm -hmm. because we, the indigenous, we were very separated from the Chilean society. Uh, today, there are indigenous people that are prepared to take the decision inside the parliament. There are lawyers. There are people that go to the, that know the academical way of thinking. So uh, it's not uh, difficult, but we need the government and the state recognize our rights to decide as indigenous, as we need the government to recognize the rights of women as decides as women. Uh, on the contrary, the colonialism will continue and also the patriarchalism of the society. We believe that the uh, Chilean society is still a colonial society because when the Spaniards came to our country, uh, they established the colonial way of government um, and have uh, also refused the indigenous people because they said that we were not, uh, um, we don't have, uh, they, they, we, we, don't, we don't have intelligence. Uh, we were primitive person. So, uh, that's what the discourse of the racism and and they created we were independent from Spaniards 
uh, but the Syrian state uh, was governed by the elite, white elite. And all of the Chilean people, uh, we continue on being um, dominated by the interests of the one elites without rights, not only the indigenous, but all the Chilean. And in, in, in the experience of the Chilean people, uh, during uh, 1992, uh, with the five uh, century of uh, Spaniard colonialism, we reinforce our way of thinking, our traditional authorities. Uh, we also created new flags uh, for us uh, to represent our struggles and our demands. And, and at that time we called to the government, government uh, the democracy was uh, initiated after the Pinochet regime at that time. We called the government to receive the flag and they, they, the government didn't want to accept us. They don't accept us, accepted our flag, our demands mm -hmm. and persecute all of the Mapuche uh, as illegal. What is the illegal thing? to have a flag, to have a traditional authorities and demand autonomy. So uh, we uh, uh, decided to participate inside uh, the constitution, constitutional process uh, in order to, to be part of the Chilean parliament, the Chilean decision, because uh, if the parliament, uh, uh, only the white people or Chilean people participate inside the parliament, they are deciding for us. Like if just the man take the decision, they decide for the women, uh, we are cl claiming to be, to have our rights. And it was a very good opportunity to, for the all the Chilean people to to have uh, that new constitution uh, to to change uh, the relationship between us in a democratic process, but we we lost it. Uh, fortunately, there are uh, a lot of uh, experience, good experience along the Latin America and in the world. We know about the experience of the Ecuador, Bolivia, but also Maori in New Zealand, Nunavut in Canada, and also indigenous people here. Uh, they have the possibility to, to, to be respected by the constitution and the, the policy from the state. And, and also we have a theory inside the academic. We have a, a humanistic theory um, that are speaking about, uh, for instance, yes, the, the, the intellectual colonialism, because uh, they are intellectual colonialism. Uh, Bandana Shiva, she spoke about that in 2020. We have also philosophy from of the South, Dussel, 2015. Uh, also, we have the, the ontology, uh, uh, different ontology. Escobar and Davalo, they spoke about that uh, uh, theory. Uh, the epistemology of the South, uh, Santos, he spoke about that. So we have theory of the feminist woman, Gladys Sul. He spoke about the communal service in Guatemala and women in also in Bolivia and also in Chile. We are speaking about the right of women, indigenous women inside the academy. So we have theory, theory to support our claim. Um, 
So the, the I want to say that the plurinationality is is not an artificial discourse. Uh, uh, without history, without context, the plurinationality have a lot of uh, support, theory, experience, rights. Recognized, recognized by the states because indigenous rights were recognized by all of the governors in the United Nations. Internationally, they recognize it, but inside of our country, they don't want to accept it. Um, yeah, so um, the... There is other special point that is very important for indigenous people uh, about the good living, uh, the Suma Causa in the Quechua language, the Suma Kamanya in the Aymara language, and Kume Mongyen in Mapudungun. What is the Kume Mongyen or good living? Uh, Pakari, he was, he, she is a woman from Ecuador, she pointed out that this corresponds to an economic model opposed to the neoliberalism and capitalism because it is an economic model of equality among human beings, uh, it said Pakari. So Macausai for indigenous people implies much more than individual well-being. Good living corresponds to a conception of law from the collective subject of peoples and nationalities who conceive um, that well-being is possible only when all others are in their situation of equality. This is our uh, philosophy, where, why we are uh, struggling as indigenous people. Um, and inside the Mapuche, a way of thinking. We have our own philosophy. Uh, we talk about the Asmapu uh, and is emphasize the reproduction of all human and non-human lives. We, the, we need to respect human and non-human lives uh, to maintain a life on the earth. Harmony, care and protection of all of species including uh, people, including animals, insects, flowers, air, water, everything. It contains a body of values and principles uh, of the Mapuche sort. We speak about Asmonien, the norms of life, uh, recognition of all forms of life, Human and non-human, itofil munien, and life in balance, human and non-human, as kume munien. So that theory, that way of thinking, supports our struggle. And when we speak about plurinationality, we want to share our way of thinking with all of the white society and West. Uh, society, because we are able to to we are able we are in condition to to put our best way of thinking to have a a, a, a better society. Um. So we lost the proposal, the constitutional proposal. But it, it was not our fault. We lost it because of hate campaign, fear and lies uh, that try to stop the democracy's advances in everywhere. And that is not good because the, they try to expose us as enemy between our friends. And we know that uh, years ago, uh, the fascism and Nazism treats uh, the people as enemy 
friend as enemy and justify the genocide of Jews, of the gypsies, and also uh, people with disability and homosexual. And we need, we don't need that uh, uh, history again. So, uh, the, I want to say to finish that presentation that today we have uh, we are in the second process of a, with a, in a second constitutional process in Chile. But unfortunately, they are making a serious mistake because they exclude the people and not uh, considering the advance of the democratic constitutional process of the first period. They try to erase the achievements of the people, uh, reproducing the racial segregation and intellectual colonialism. As you know, uh, they have not wanted to incorporate indigenous people as advisor uh, or specialists in the design of the new constitutional process. And they don't include indigenous special seats and also the right for water, the right for nature. We don't know what will, what will happen, but this is a big error because we were part of the history and they cannot uh, stop our history in, 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 that, uh, in, in these uh, uh, forums. The indigenous people uh, cannot, uh, uh, cannot continue to be denied. Our fight is the fierce uh, fight that has taken place in the history of uh, our country in Chile and also in America. It's the most beautiful and generous because we defend love to our people for love for our mother heart. Uh, it recognizes the people, women, and non-indigenous equal in dignity and law. Uh, but beyond that, we defend mother heart, contributing to solving the crisis that uh, affect today the humanity. To finish my presentation, I want to express my solidarity to the strike of the student of this university that are claiming for the better salary. I know the student need a uh, condition to get uh, their objective in everywhere, in my country and also here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stop and to introduce Mr. Fletcher, who will provide an interview. Mr. Fletcher is the head of the Department of Law at the University He served as judge on numerous criminal courts. He sits as Chief Justice on the Indian Civil Rights Commission. Serves as an analytic 
society for the construction of growth and development of private companies. Right, there is a long form that the director also looks for key concepts within the philosophy to help resolve complex questions in community relations and politics. So we can take this whole question. I thought that's okay. I'll give you the voice. Yeah, okay. And it's the last set. So it's thus a particular pleasure that I introduce Matthew Fletcher to offer comments on the work of the research. I think my mic's on. Eh? Well, um, Jimmy Gwetch, thank you all for having me here and for be, I, it's an amazing honor to be invited to sit with um, Elise Longcon, who is way more famous than anybody I've ever met, I think. Um, so that's, uh, it's kind of intimidating too. Um, I deeply appreciate your remarks and this uh, book. I, I did take uh, 16 credits of Spanish in uh, college. 20, almost 30, well, 30 years ago now. And um, I have to make a confession that um, a, a lady came up earlier. Uh, what was her name? Ileana, I think. Yeah. You know her? She she was my freshman, first, first semester ever, my instructor in Spanish. And uh, it took me about halfway through your talk to realize that was her, and then she left. So. Um, so yes, so I have, I'm gonna make um, some, I guess, scholarly academic -y type uh, observations. I'm a commentator, so it's a little bit unusual for me, uh, a little bit different for me to be in this role. So I'll do my best. I'll make three observations. Um, the first is going to be uh, sort of a comparison between the plurinationalism that is theorized in your, uh, in your work and your draft constitution, um, your proposed constitution in the United States. I'm going to talk a little bit about tribal courts because I think that's why I'm here. And uh, a little bit, I think, speculating about what an American constitutional convention might look like. So, um, and as you could probably imagine, I'm a little bit skeptical or something about that. So, um, let's talk about the United States and where, where the United States is in this role. You, the U.S. is kind of already a plurinational state. We, you know, the United, the founders wrote it into the Constitution. There are, um, state governments that are effectively sovereign in a lot of respects. There are foreign nations that do things here. And there are also Indian tribes written right into the text of the constitution. Um, so what I'm gonna say first is plurinationalism in the US is uh, for indigenous peoples was non-existent. You give them a big fat F as a teacher up until <laughs> at least the 1970s, 1980s. Um, the United States was doing nothing uh, other than trying to effectively exterminate either directly or indirectly uh, tribal nations in, in the United States. But since the 1970s, um, it's gotten a little bit better. So I, I'm gonna give them a, a, a grade of a D minus, um, but trending upward. And, and that's a really good thing. And it's, it's trending upward because tribal nations in the US are doing all the work they are. Um, earning their sovereignty in a way that, as a child, I couldn't have imagined. So um, that's really delightful to see. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the founding philosophy of the U.S. with its Declaration of Independence and Constitution and Bill of Rights and the constitutions of the various state governments and even many tribal constitutions. Um, these constitutions are vertical constitutions. They deliver power, reserve power to um, a top of a hierarchy. So in the United States, that means Congress, an executive branch run by the president, um, and even a, a, chief, a Supreme Court. And every state is modeled on this theory that uh, on this structure that there is a, a sovereign entity with power over all of us. And that, that is presumed in the Western political philosophy that undergirds everything in the United States and most Western societies, Canada, all the, all the settler colonial nations, all of the colonized nations of Latin America or the Western hemisphere have this structure as the presumption. 
And really the constitution and the bill of rights and even the declaration of independence, which really went law, but it's a statement of political philosophy. Um, though the texts of those, uh, of those documents are not really designed to ensure the hierarchy. The hierarchy is presumed. They're designed to ensure a couple of other things that as the government shifts over time, as society shifts over time, some individuals will have protections from that government because really the government is what Thomas Hobbes called the Leviathan. It, it can take our lives as it sees fit. So we like to call our constitution, our bill of rights, our individual protections, something like a social contract where we've agreed to give up elements of our individual rights to a government. But the presumption is that we can't live without this government. And that presumption is empirically false because indigenous peoples lived without a top-down hierarchical government with a monopoly on violence for so long hundreds of thousands of years probably, or as long as people have organized into communities. Um, so that fundamentally is a, a difference. When I, when I hear the discussion or the description of the draft uh, of the proposed constitution, many elements to that proposed constitution assumed a different kind of philosophy where there is no need for a top-down hierarchical government a Leviathan with a monopoly on violence. So um, let me talk a little bit about uh, tribal justice systems in the United States. It sounds like to me talking with uh, Professor Scott over here that, um, you know, that's a big sticking point in Chile from the right wing is the idea that there could be uh, you know, a, pluri a plurination, so to speak, with its own justice system that is exercising its own discretion to interpret its laws, its power to enforce those laws, and exercising jurisdiction over individuals who are within their territory but who aren't who aren't of that ethnicity. Um, this is a, this is a discussion in the United States with our tribal court systems. It is pretty much half or more of the Supreme Court cases on Indian law are about the power of tribes over uh, non-Indians, non-members. And uh, I would say that where, where we're heading, and I, the book that I wrote, Ghost Road, is a part of that, is um, you know tribal courts sort of came about in large part in the 1970s with the advent of self-determination, but they were copies of state and federal courts. We borrowed law from state state governments from, from state and federal governments. We, we borrowed the adversarial system of state and federal courts. We, you know, we, we borrowed judges from state. You know, the first judge I ever appeared from in, before was before the Pascua Yaqui tribe in Tucson, Arizona, and the judge was a retired state court judge and needed a job. So uh, we did all of these things as tribal nations for, and are still in large respects doing these things. But in the last few decades, we've started to uh, do some work to try to rethink what those laws mean in a tribal community. And so that's some of the work that um, Professor Scott emphasized on trying to work on what we call, what I call customary law, or it is sometimes called common law, where we introduce our traditions, our language into these court opinions that are the product of an adversarial process that we've borrowed from the United States. And uh, I, I like to think that we've been doing some good work in that way. Um, tribal legislatures are adopting and incorporating uh, customary law into their, their work. Their work. Um, child welfare, criminal justice, you will hear the discussion of Minobu Madzawin, which in Anishinaabemowin means uh, the act of living a good life which sounds a lot to me, and I'll probably butcher this, your uh, Mapuche principle of Kime Munyan, something to that effect. It's also, and in, in, in Spanish is a buen vivir, good life. Um, so these are really broad principles that uh, legal theorists might refer to as natural law. And um, they are rooted in interconnectedness and in sort of a vertical way of philosoph philosophizing about how to live 
and it does acknowledge connections between animate and inanimate objects, between humans and animals, um, even supernatural entities. And uh, you know, when when I teach my classes on political theory, when in my Indian law classes and in American constitutional law, I try to remind the students that you know, Western political thought assumes humans exercise dominion over all things. And uh, I always ask them, I'm being facetious when I do this, but have you ever seen the American military stop a tornado? It's just, it's not gonna happen. So, I mean, there are forces that humans cannot, and will ever not be able to control. And we know this. All you have to do is look out the window today and see snow. And look at, of course, climate change impacts around the world. These are things that many indigenous nations, and I think my own indigenous nations, the Anishinaabe nations, have acknowledged for a long time. So um, the last comment I wanted to make is, what, what does a, an American constitutional convention look like? And, and here's what I would say, is that um, in tribal nations in the U U.S., uh, in any given year, the, there, are, there's con there are constitutions being made. And a few years back, there was a tribe in Wisconsin, or excuse me, Minnesota, called the White Earth Nation. It's an Ojibwe community. And um, their, their tribal constitution comes from the 1940s and 50s, right? It is a constitution that is heavily influenced by the Department of the Interior, the colonizer, it is, um, some of it is restrictive unnecessarily of the powers of the tribe. And it is also um, completely silent as to, it was completely silent as to the customary law of the tribe, I guess it still is. The constitution, uh, long story short, spoiler alert, that they, the tribal community rejected it. Um, but it, in the, the process of the constitutional convention, books have been written about it. It's the way to go about uh, modifying your constitution. It's a way to incorporate um, customs and traditions and also to rethink about what a constitution really means for, um, for any human society. Uh, I would also look to um, state Supreme Courts, weirdly enough. And um, the Hawaiian Supreme Court, starting in the 1980s, began slowly filtering into its opinions on ecological impacts and water law, especially the uh, principles and understandings of how water works in Hawaii, in the Hawaiian islands, using native Hawaiian principles and themes. And in fact, water law in Hawaii is indigenous. Um, I don't know if you know much about the geography of Hawaii. I don't know much. I've been there a couple of times, but it's got volcanoes. <laughs> so, and so it's got a lot of weird, uh, different archaeo uh, geographic things and water runs downhill based on, you know, sort of where the, where the high, high water mark is and it comes downhill that way. And that's in, indigenous uh, water law in Hawaii is based on the geologic ob the obviousness of what, how water works. Whereas if you try to bring in Western riparian water law into Hawaii, which is really what the colonizer wanted to do. You draw lines, artificial lines across places where it doesn't make sense. And uh, then this is a really fascinating ex uh, experiment and observation. I don't know, know anything about water law in Hawaii, but I think this is a fascinating possibility. The last thing I would say is, and I'll conclude here, I don't know what an American constitutional convention would look like, but I'm pretty sure, given my experience with uh, an observation of the United States Supreme Court, that pretty much every time they interpret the Constitution, they think of themselves as the Constitutional Convention. So we've, I don't know if you've seen that, know much about American constitutional law, but it seems like it changes every couple of weeks. And that's a Constitutional Convention. Uh, I'll stop there and say, you go ahead. Stop again. Okay, so um, we were we have some time to take some questions, and we're going to follow uh, a principle that is often followed in the law school, which is that students have top priority for asking questions. And so I I will I will I won't insist that everyone swear that they're a student if they've got their hand up right now, but you're on, PhD student. There we go. Okay. 
So you Hi, uh, I'm Rosario. I'm Chilean and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Michigan. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, Dr. Loncon, with all the respect uh, possible, um, considering that most that 60% of the Chilean population rejected the proposal, what do you think the convention in general or maybe you as the president of the convention could have done differently in order that this proposal that you told us about could have been approved by the people. Thank you. A small question. <laughs> bueno, y si usted quiere hablar en español, también podemos traducir. Si está, si está cansada, no hay problema. Usted habla, yo, yo le traduzco. Okay. Um, I want to say that... Uh, we we can do a better the better process but we needed support to do it and one fault that we had is we don't we didn't have a um, communicate a program to communicate to the people what was were doing inside the convention the Consti uh, Chilean Constitutional Convention was the most transparent process that we had <clears throat> in our history. But people far from Santiago, they don't, uh, they didn't uh, receive the message because the media was used by the right uh, uh, parties that manipulate the information. So they, they didn't receive that too. We will, it will be good for us to have a, a, a good a communicational program, but we didn't have supports of money and also political management to install inside the country, that kind of communication, communication for the people. So other, other questions? Oh, I'll wait for, <laughs> uh, let me give the students one more minute, okay? Uh, yes. Um, hi, thank you so much. I. Um, I'm curious in the contemporary constitutionalism movements if um, memoria historica or like historical reckoning has or hasn't played any role to these kind of forward facing um, social movements. Um, yeah, the uh, the me historical memory of the Chilean people, the what happened along the history, we claim for two. We claim for that for two because of violation of human rights, justice for uh, violation of indigenous rights. Uh, also, the, we need the women uh, uh, to use their own voice to promote their rights. All of that discussion, we, we had it inside the convention uh, in order to change that uh, uh, historical memory of our society of oppression, because we most, uh, the majority of the Chilean people, we were oppressed by the political and economical system and also the patriarchal and colonial uh, system. So one question that came in um, on the webinar was a question about archiving the results of the Constitutional Convention. One thing that was very striking during the convention was that uh, material was made public 
quite regularly. Will there also be an archive of the convention so that people who want to learn more about what, what transpired in that convention can access it? Um, sí, habrá un archivo de, de, de lo, que, lo que sucedió, sí. There is a, there, there, there are, there are information inside the parliaments, the also library of the parliament. Um, there are a lot of information inside the, that's a page. And, and also there are the, the proposal written in, Spanish, English, also indigenous languages. So you can find information inside the, the that's a, a page that belongs to the parliament, to the Congress also. Yeah. And do we have any more student questions? Yes. Okay. Two more student questions, and then I won't forget that there's a non student question. Yeah. Um, so, in your opinion, what does the decentralization of Chile look like in the future, as in independent states, the union? Yeah, for us um, and also for the regions, different because we have a very long country and Santiago is very far from the south and from the north. And the central region decentralization means to have uh, autonomy uh, to deal with the uh, uh, regional policy and also regional development, uh, cultural development inside the region too, because uh, the region of the culture is along Chile. All of the territory have different uh, regions to, to have a plural, a plural uh, society. So culture is not the same in Santiago or, or, or in the South is very different. So decentralization means to manage uh, with autonomy, a different policy connected with development, economical development, cultural development, regional development, also the use of languages. Because in the north part of Chile, we have a different indigenous language. We have Quechua and Aymara. And in the very south part of Chile, we have Kawashka, Selkman, uh, Patagonian uh, culture and different language too. So we'll be better to have a autonomy, regional autonomy in order to contribute to the diversity of the, our country. And we have a question from Isaac. Um, do you feel like there were outside groups with economic interests in Chile that were involved either directly or indirectly in the opposition to the ratification of the Constitution? That is a is really a real uh, the uh, because we 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 think that the the, the political model and economical model that we had today in Chile uh, is a um, uh, is a um, there are a lot of uh, uh, rich people or people from the from from the elite along the world that are using that uh, uh, resource from Chile. We have, for instance, a big company, forestry, big company. Uh, they use our lands and use our water, uh, but all of the reason that they, they use it from, they took it from our land, it go to outside. So the political Chilean model have support from uh, rich people from outside. And that is true. And... Uh, I believe you had a question. I'd like to know what was the condition of the indigenous their relationship with the rest of Chile during uh, President Allende for the short time, and also what's the relationship between the Chilean uh, government and Bolivia? Bolivia is mostly indigenous. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yes, uh, um, Allende, uh, 
he developed uh, a popular government, uh, a democratic government, and including uh, indigenous uh, social rights for us, for indigenous people, right for education, for uh, health. Uh, he had a very beautiful campaign of uh, 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 milk campaign for the poor children, for instance. So, um, uh, indigenous people uh, uh, feel felt at that time that uh, uh, that government helped to the indigenous people, but we were just initiating a relationship with the government at that time, and and there was something weak too inside the political parties because uh, the political parties that support the government from the left, they also uh, had a European uh, European philosophy in order to support the political parties. The, the knowledge from the Europe, from the left, for the, uh, and they don't recognize our way of thinking. This was weak. So um, today, uh, with the indigenous people, uh, not all not all, not all of us have the same way of thinking. Uh, at that time, in, in during the conventional process, emerged the women, indigenous women, uh, to to be the uh, to be part of the decision, because most of the time uh, there were just uh, our brothers doing that. So um, we also, we still have uh, uh, the very, uh, uh, that way of the left way of thinking inside of our community um, that they, they prefer other strategy to get our rights. We are not, uh, uh, we have different way of thinking inside of our movement. So uh, as uh, we as women, we are claiming our way of thinking, our knowledge, our history, our rights. But uh, it's a process. We need, uh, we also, we think that it would be good to have a, a the same, the same objective, because all of the indigenous people, we claim the same objective, autonomy, language, uh, territory, but we need to, to share the same strategy too, because we were divided using different strategy. And there, there were people, indigenous people that, that call for refuse the proposal of the new constitution. As the left people, the people from the right, left party did, did it too. Socialist parties, they vote divided. Democrat, uh, Democrats, uh, Democratic Party also vote divided. So uh, it's, uh, maybe the neoliberal way of thinking is in very deep in our people. Did you want to say there was one question about Bolivia? About ah, what country. happened with Bolivia? <laughs> yeah, we we learn from Bolivia, we learn from Ecuador, as we learn from South Africa, for instance, because uh, because uh, as uh, we were discussing the new uh, constitution, we take a uh, from different experience we took the better proposals to, in order to to reinforce our our article inside the, the the constitution and the plurinationality of Bolivia and Ecuador is different from the plurinationality that we designed in our proposal because we include all of the Chilean movement uh, inside the plurinationality. Plurinationality is not only for indigenous, but also for all of the Chilean people. So we need to share our, uh, we need to, all of us, we need our rights back. And also we need to share our cultural language and 
And to all of us, we need to have a, that uh, ecological way of thinking in order to protect Mother Nation. It's not only a matter of indigenous, but also the matter of all of the Chilean people. We have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Professor Langland, yeah. Um, well, first, thank you both for, for those comments. They were really wonderful. Um, I was thinking about Professor Fletcher's comment about the presuppositions about what a constitution is, which made me want to ask Professor Loncon about how challenging it was to convince the other members of the Constitutional Convention about some of the aspects that ended up being part of the proposal. And then as a, you know, like how difficult were those internal conversations? And then as a second part, were there any things that you wanted to see there that didn't make it, that met so much resistance within those internal conversations that they're not in the final document? I'll just add a footnote, which is you might mention the question of language rights, which I gather right up to the end was debated. So for me, for instance, I, I loved to have a good discussion with uh, women from the right parties. They were very, uh, uh, they treat us with a deep racism. Mm -hmm. They fear about our languages. They fear about our dress. But I, when I, we initiate the process, I, I thought when we will finish, all of us, we will be able to talk about the same point about the plural nationality and all of the um, right of all of the people. I, I believe that I, and I, I was thinking to, to, to get that objective, but it was very difficult to discuss with them because they, uh, people from the right parties, they went uh, to the commission in order to to stop the people uh, rights because they defend their privilege the uh, the economical model that today have that chile have today the neoliberal model is good for the elite for the rich people so they they don't go to discuss with us. They they went to stop our demand inside the convention, mm -hmm. and that is was very very hard for for us. So today I believe that the parity is not a, a, is not enough because. We were women, all of the convention, we were women. But inside that women, there were women that was against with the indigenous women, the racism. So we need, uh, we need to, I think that we need to be more plural, pluralist, plural position. And the right people don't have plural position. And, and so this is, was very difficult, was very difficult. The racism, the, the making also um, bullying to the indigenous people inside the convention and using the social media uh, every day. Uh, so, and, and for me, uh, what's, uh, I went to the convention uh, in order to to introduce the language right, language right, educational rights, and and so we need more time to discuss about that point. 
uh, because uh, they were not clear about uh, what that is mean. Not all the people understand why we put those rights inside the conventions. They and the people from there uh, against people that, uh, that, are, that were against uh, to the proposal, they said that they, that is privilege, privilege for indigenous people. Mm -hmm. But it's our rights, not privilege. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here. Yeah. Gracias, Dr. Aloncon. Um, I had a quick follow-up question to the um, autonomy of the regions and indigenous populations. Um, I wanted to know how that affected on, in the, con the new constitution or proposed constitution, how that affected the right of indigenous communities and de las regiones to regulate trade with communities outside of Chile. So how certain Mapuche communities could potentially trade with Mapuche communities in Argentina or um, Quechua communities could trade in the north with Quechua communities in Peru or Bolivia if that was part of the autonomy of las regiones and the populations or if that was not part of what would be considered the political, economic and cultural development. Um, you know, we design a constitution for the Chilean people. And we have uh, indigenous people in, in Mapuche in Argentina or indigenous Aymara in Bolivia, but they are in other countries. So there is a, a sovereignty of the, of the Chilean. Uh, uh, so we cannot decide what is what will happen in the other country. So uh, that is a point that uh, that point is is not our matter inside the discussion. I think we could take one more question. I see someone in the back. Yeah. Thank you. I'm wondering about the internal discussion of the Constitutional Convention. What kinds of considerations were made regarding the practical chances of the new proposed constitution passing? Because it did not pass by a lot. So were you trying to simply get internally what you thought was the best or what also would be functional and would pass the plebiscite vote? Thank you. Um, uh, the Constitution project is a future project for a nation. Uh, it's very difficult to, and we used to say said at that time that with the new with the new Constitution, we uh, we were not able to to solve economical and political problem immediately. Uh, we need time to time uh, for the people uh, in order to get a uh, other idea of Chilean state uh, and the idea of plurinationality. So uh, um, it's a project of future and you need to deal with that project uh, making the transformation of the society. Uh, we don't have a, a specific answer to this question, but we just understand that it's a project of future and we need to develop along, along the time uh, for, a, for, for more, for, uh, for different, we need time to do it. Thank you to everyone. Thank you particularly to our two speakers. This has been an extraordinary experience. We've really been very privileged to have you both here with us at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much.